This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 22, Episode 9. My name is Chris, and I'm all by myself today, just for a little bit. But coming up in today's episode, Michael, the proprietor and founder of Phronix.com, who's been following the Steam on Linux story, joins me. And we chat about not just sort of the vindication that Phronix.com has had from this, but also some hints at some really big plans beyond just the Steam client that Valve has for Linux. But before we get to that, I want to give you my Linux picks this week because you know so many things out in the world run Linux. And so does this 8-bit micro board. Check this thing out. This little 8-bit micro computer actually has the capability. Now, mind you, it runs at 6... 0.5 kilohertz or 10 kilohertz. Uh, it does have a little bit of memory on there, and it can actually run Linux 2.6.34. In fact, if you're patient enough, you can even bring up an entire Ubuntu stack. Uh, if you are listening to the audio version, you picture like a like a, a a breadboard from your garage that you might punch a few circuits onto and then run some wires. Uh, that's literally exactly what this is. And uh, this guy got it. Now, uh, it's certainly no speed demon. It takes about two hours to boot to the bash prompt. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's really just to get to the point where the kernel can start up. Uh, starting X takes a lot longer. Um, some CPU functions have to be emulated as well on top of that. So that's, that's pretty crazy. So check that out. I have a link to that in the show notes. But that's got to be one of the craziest. And uh, Cyberax sent that into the show. So thank you to Cyberax for uh, submitting um, this week's run Linux. Now, uh, I have a very handy, um, well, <clears throat> I'll put it this way. If you ever need this kind of functionality on your Android phone, you're going to be very thankful for today's app. You're probably some sort of super spy that has an international plan to save the world, but uh, so you might already know about this if you're that kind of person. But maybe you're becoming one of those people, so you'll need my Android pick. But before... I get to that. I have to say good morning to the fine folks over at GoDaddy.com. GoDaddy.com sponsoring this week's episode. Good morning to the beautiful Danica Patrick. Boy, she looks great today sitting there uh, rocking the GoDaddy homepage. And of course, uh, it is almost the end of, end of the month, if you can believe that. July is almost over. So if you want to get a .com, if you want to get a crazy good deal on a .com for $7.99, use our code four, or $4.99. Use our code 4 95 Linux. Uh, you can also use our code Linux to save 10% at checkout and Linux 20 to save 20% on hosting. But 495 Linux is a great deal. Uh, so uh, get your .com. It expires at the end of July, you guys. $4.95 for a .com. That's crazy. That's crazy. And thank you to GoDaddy and the beautiful Danica Patrick for sponsoring this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Now, let me sh share my Android pick with you because, uh, like I said, if you need this, you're going to be thankful. It's called TechSecure, and there's an interesting reason it showed up on my radar this week. Now, TechSecure is a free app, and you probably guessed it by the name, is it gives you encrypted two-way text communication. So you can actually text back and forth without letting people spy on it, whoever that might be. I don't know. You're paranoid. You, you're the one with the tinfoil hat. Don't look at me. It's not my idea. This is your idea. So, so whatever. The reason these guys showed up on my radar is because of a thread in our handy uh, subreddit called uh, Redphone. Uh, a red phone is essentially what they're offering for text messages only for phone calls. Now, it's in beta, and uh, I haven't tried it yet, so I'm not making it a pick yet. But I'm very interested that supposedly you can do secured, tunneled, phone calls over the regular phone network, I, I guess. I don't actually know how it works, so I want to look into it. But when I was researching the company, I came across this app, Tech Secure Beta, which seems like a really great idea. And, you know, that way, if you want to uh, text your hookup, you don't have to worry about the man sniffing, on, sn sniffing in on your packets. So you're welcome. See what I do for you? All right. Now, uh, my Linux desktop pick, I'm moving right through these because I want to get to the interview with Michael. He's uh, joining me live from Munich, and he is in a bandwidth-constrained uh, environment, just a warning to you. Uh, he's on a business trip, but when the news broke, I contacted him and said, would you come on the show? We record Sundays, 10 a.m., and he said yes. But uh, So we're going to get to him, but just as a forewarning to that. Before I do, though, here's the desktop pick for this week. It's called Ocean Audio. Now, it's 
O-C-E-N, so don't get all confused. Uh, and it is a very fast, very lightweight audio editor for Linux. It actually is available for multiple platforms. But uh, if you're familiar with on the, here's a screenshot of it from the Mac. If you're familiar with applications like Armored DS Pro or some of those um, very, very responsive, very good, accurate uh, waveform generation, so you can bring up something like an MP3 or a WAV file or an AUG file to read different compressed formats even, make quick trims, maybe you want to make turn a song into a ringtone, something like that. You open it up in this program, make a quick clip, and then export it right out. It's a really neat little app. It's very small, and it's uh, it's already available like in the Ubuntu repos and most distro repos, but uh, we also have links to packages on their sites in the show notes. And again, that is, I think I'm getting this right, it's Ocean Audio, and the reason why I'm not so sure is because it's O-C-E-N Audio. So you know me and words, you guys, it's they're hard. Uh, and here, I'll put a link to it in the uh, show notes because there's a good description on how to use it, too. It's a great article that uh, was up on UbuntuGeek.com. It also has support for VST plugins. So if you're already using some plugins like through Audacity... Okay, here's a good example. So this, I would say, is not a, a replacement to Audacity. Uh, this is like if you want to do something quick... And Audacity, it takes a little bit to load up. If it's a large WAV file, it takes quite a while to import. Yeah, it's not exactly the cleanest user interface, whereas this is very simple, very fast, very clean. So that's kind of where it fits in theirs. For me, like I do, for example, I have found that I clip a lot of audio these days for the new show Unfilter we have on the network. And uh, Unfilter is uh, is very, very packed full of audio clips from current news events or from public figures or whatever it is. And this app has been perfect because if I record something and I just need to go grab like, okay, well, they're really just kind of saying nothing for the first five minutes, so I just need to cut that off. I open it right up here, cut, save, done, and then I have the clips ready uh, for Unfilter. And speaking of Unfilter, uh, I, I would encourage all of you to check out episode 10. It's our 10, if you believe this, we've been doing this for 10 weeks, you guys. I've been, I that, that went really fast. That blows my mind. And, uh, very, I'm very, very proud of uh, episode 10 of Unfilter. It turned out great. We looked at Blackwater, aka Academy or Z Systems, and how private military contractors really got their start, how the war on terror sort of changed those things, and uh, really kind of what the future for these companies holds now that some of our uh, some of our battles are, are sort of coming down, winding down, but um, there's also future expansion for them. Things like... Uh, privatized intelligence gathering and things like that. Very fascinating show. So uh, go check it out. It's, it's worth a little bit of your time to learn uh, how those companies make money and how all of that works. And that's episode 10 of Unfilter, and you can find a link to that in the show notes as well. All right. Well, let's go cover our top news story. That's Valve coming to Linux, and let's go chat with Michael. Of course, the top story on the news docket this week is last week, Monday, after the big show came out, Valve posted on their blog an official announcement that they were developing Steam for Linux, and they called it Steamed Penguins. This was also the announcement of their new blog. Uh, big Things Have Small Beginnings was one of their titles. Now, of course, we talked about this on the, on the uh, show last week. And uh, while I said I went on record saying I was hopeful, I was still being uh, guardedly skeptical. But uh, it turned out it was all true. And someone who's been following the story from the very beginning, from what I call even Square Zero, is Michael from Phronics.com. And he joins us on the line right now to talk about this big story. Michael, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, how are you doing? I'm very good. Thanks for coming in from Munich. I know you were over there on a business trip and you had to go find like a nice public spot to do a connection, so I appreciate you joining me. What time is it over there right now? Uh, right now it's uh, 7.30 right now. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, is Larbell, is that how you pronounce your last name? Uh, yes, yeah, correct, Larbell. Okay, so let's talk about this huge announcement. So obviously this is this is a big vindication for Phronics.com, isn't it? Um, yes, it is, except you guys right now are getting excited. Okay, the Steam is coming. That's yeah. great, but that's all. That's not all that's coming. As you mentioned in the beginning with the blog post, uh, big things have small happening. And this is just the beginning. So uh, you uh, you have you have an idea, but you can't really share much with us that there might be more than just Steam, the desktop client, and more than just Left for Dead, the game, but a bigger Linux play on top of all of that. Um, well, as Mike Sartain pointed out in his blog post. Beyond Left 4 Dead 2, they do plan to pour many more games over to Linux. And as you have seen from some of the blog postings elsewhere, they do have job openings for hardware engineers, device driver engineers. Right, right. They are working with Intel and AMD on open source graphics drivers, etc. They have many good things planned for the future. 
Uh, yeah, that's actually an interesting story that came out this week that you covered on Phronics.com is that uh, they are working with Intel to improve Intel's open source driver performance. Uh, c- correct. Um, last week, the Intel crew was out there working on their Mesa DRI driver, working for performance optimizations, and they and made they, a lot of good progress. They actually, the, the, Intel, the Intel crew actually flew out to Valve's Bellevue headquarters and actually worked side-by-side side with Valve engineers to directly yes, address some correct. of the issues. Yes, exactly. And um, I can tell you, as of last night, I talked with one of the uh, AMD guys that I was re- working on recruiting for um, Valve that he will be out there in a few weeks, so hopefully we'll see some open source API improvements. Hmm. in the future. Hmm. Interesting. It's 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 very it's very cool to see Valve go at this in a way that is very true to the open source spirit where they can be. Um, I guess, uh, Michael, I did I, uh, I I wanted to chat with you on uh, how you kind of originally got wind of this story, and uh, you also took some heat from different outlets, including us on this show, saying that you might have been just generating uh, link bait. How did all of this start? How did it kind of land uh, in your lap with the story? Did, uh, did, you, did you pick something up, or what's the, what's the backstory? Going back to earlier this year, Gabe Noel contacted me, and he was looking for help recruiting for uh, open job developers because they wanted to improve their performance and mm-hmm. overall up their team. Do you have, have, you ha- have you heard anything on the status of, of what some of these game ports are, like how playable they might be, or what kind of time frame we might be seeing until uh, we might actually see something show up available for download for users? All right. Um, back in April, for Left 4 Dead 2, that was largely playable. It was like 40 to 60 frame rates on the proprietary Linux graphics drivers. Really? And that's working out pretty well. And like, there's no problem at all. And so obviously once they have a sort of engine working for Linux, it's very easy to port yeah. Counter Strike on other games there. So, well, so what do you think about that? I mean, that's that's probably been the biggest piece of negative feedback that I've seen from our audience. Uh, there was definitely a, a theme that ran through in our subreddit and on some of the emails yeah. I got is that well, if they're only if they're only developing this for Ubuntu, then they might as well not be developing at all because I don't run Ubuntu. I run Distro X. Do you think uh, do you think this is uh, potentially a uh, a future trend we're going to be seeing with Ubuntu? Um, no, not at all. I made it very clear back in April when talking with Gabe and with Max Artain and the others that basically, obviously it makes sense to focus on Ubuntu in the beginning because Ubuntu is obviously the most popular Linux distribution, including der- derivatives like Linux Mint. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously overall, if they put out a simple ChargeZ package from their different Linux distributors, can obviously package it and do whatever the hell they want and it will work out fine. And you will see they will not be targeting ex- explicitly Ubuntu. Hmm. Now, uh, can, you ch- can you chat a little bit about some of the high-profile developers that Valve has recently uh, hired? Because I think this paints a really interesting bigger picture because they're bringing on a team of real established experts who have uh, some some real cachet in the, in the development community. And I, I, I saw an article that you ran here on, uh, on July 14th. Valve picks up another all-star Linux developer, and uh, this one was, a, I think, a kernel developer? Is that right? Uh, and then most recently, uh, Forest Tail for um, Dark Places Engine with the Nexuiz and Zonatic Engine. Picked him up uh, for Valve. Uh, the lead developer of the best deal right now for the... He's been picked up for Valve as well as several other people in talks right now. Well, that's that's an that's a very interesting, and that shows how serious they are about it. Uh, Michael, our our connection is not so great, so I'll, I'll probably have to let you go here pretty soon. But I I know there's got to be something to the story that uh, has has struck you. Any th- any any last thoughts you want to share before we before we run? Ah uh, yes. Yeah. So as your show has thought of in several other websites in the past few months. Yeah. You guys thought that Michael Airbell is fucking crazy for thinking Valve software, right. software is Linux. The fact of the matter is, this is the only thing the beginning. So you finally believe it now. There's so much other crazy things coming that let Valve software proceed on Linux. They will show that it is tremendous for Linux. If Valve cannot proceed for Linux, then they have failed, and the Linux system has failed. Wow. So the, your, your, your assertion is, is their, their grand plan here is so massive that this is it. This is the big push. Correct. Honestly, if Valve software cannot proceed and be profitable on Linux, no other company can be, and the Linux desktop will fail. Valve has very many interesting things coming forward for Linux, and it should be a very good time ahead. So when will you be able to share some of the additional information that you've learned? Is there a 
do you have any can you even say anything about that well, yeah, I was game set on um, through some post edit up on Phronics by the end of 2012 this year there will be the native Linux client for Steam okay. and going forward there's been job postings about hardware engineers device driver engineers etc the have many things Wow well I'm really excited now. Uh, what I want to do, since we're, since we're going to cut this one a little short, since we kind of have a spotty connection, you're on a business trip, is uh, I'll make sure we get you on the show again. I'm sure there'll be future things we can talk about. And I'd love to talk you, to you about some of the things you do over there on Phronics, like the benchmarking suite and things like that. So would you come on a future show and chat about those things? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, tomorrow we're uh, announcing Phronics Suite for that old Soro, as well as an announcing future plans for Uta Schleifheim and Randerberg which will be codenamed to be talked about on future shows. Well, uh, thanks for coming on during the business trip and chatting about the huge news. Let's talk again soon. All right, well, our first story on the news docket after the big Valve news. Thanks again to Michael for coming on, and we'll get you on again, Michael, when you have a good internet connection. Uh, this was a popular story on our subreddit. Dell is going to offer its official. Their Sputnik program is launching the XPS 13 this autumn, which... Uh, is actually I'm kind of surprised that it's that far out since uh, <laughs> they're actually taking the existing XPS 13 and just shipping Ubuntu on. I don't believe they're actually going to be doing any hardware changes. Now Adele did a pilot program here to see what the response was. They've also been all over OSCON, and uh, it would appear it would appear that the response has been extremely positive. Uh, they uh, they are. Uh, I, I feel like they're a little late to the game. I mean, obviously, we already have companies like uh, Zay Systems or System76 who are doing really, especially System76, who are doing a really good job filling that, that niche. But I really want the Ultrabook to come to uh, the Linux desktop in a really big supported way. I think Linux is the absolute perfect candidate for an Ultrabook. Number one, although Valve's going to change all this, so this is kind of ironic, but Linux isn't huge for gaming. That's just kind of the fact of life right now. I mean, it's definitely doable, but like if you're a hardcore gamer and and having a high-end GPU is very high on your list, you're probably going to tend towards Windows. That's just the fact of life. So that sort of makes Ultrabooks a little more palatable for Linux users to begin with because generally our GPU requirements might be a little lower. Now, that's not always the case, but it might be true. You combine the way they can integrate with Ubuntu and all those kinds of things, I really think Linux could be the ultimate Ultrabook platform. So I really want to see System76 do these kinds of things. I'm glad to see Ubuntu doing, or Dell doing these kinds of things with Ubuntu. Um, would be interesting to see somebody do uh, this based off of another distribution to kind of see what we could see there, maybe OpenSUSE. Or something like that. That'd be really cool. But anyways, so there you go. If you've been uh, if you've been itching for a machine, Dell plans to offer a solution to your scratch. Although, again, I'm a little bummed that it's autumn and they're just repackaging an existing box. Uh, I'd rather they sort of had custom built something targeted for the Linux user, Inst it, flashing it with an Ubuntu image, and then and then saying, "Oh, but we've also installed development libraries. It's cool. It's good. It's good." But then why couldn't I just buy an XPS 13 right now and just format it and put Ubuntu on there? Um, anyways, next story, Plasma Active and Make Play Live were definitely uh, big topics at the Academy Conference, and Aaron Saigo took the stage and answered a few questions about the state of the Vivaldi tablet. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. This isn't good, you guys. Uh, Saigo cited Android as being a best friend and worst enemy of open devices when talking about uh, potential hardware issues. He says it uses the Linux kernel, and it's great there are so many devices out there running Linux, but Google does no GPL enforcement, which results in mostly binary-only devices for device manufacturers. Getting Android to boot is just the end goal, so the device can be sold. Once they can deliver a working binary kernel to their customers, they're done. So they don't have any source code, for example, to hand over to, uh, to the MakePlay project when uh, they ask for it. Um, he says manufacturers are all about volume, and uh, open source devices aren't necessarily selling in the volumes that gets them very interested. Further on in the Q&A, Saigo held up a tablet, noting that this was the second revision of the Vali hardware that they were just about ready to ship with. Uh, Make Play Live's hardware partner said that they were almost done, and using this hardware, the company got 98% of the way to a complete product, and they began demonstrating the project, the product widely. He said it just needed a little more polish before it was ready to ship. But then a third revision of the hardware arrived. The new hardware looked identical on the outside, but was completely different internally. Make Play Live found out about the changes after the fact and were not able to provide input on the new designs. Because of the volume devices that Make Play Live could promise to sell was fairly low, the manufacturer had little interest in consulting 
or even notifying the company about the changes. Yikes. That uh, just talk about being completely powerless in a, in this in this whole field that's dominated by these big dogs and um, and more so now that Microsoft's getting in there with the Surface and it's and the Nexus Seven, while a, a universally loved tablet, is a volume tablet that makes these kinds of efforts just not even on the radar of these manufacturers. It's I can understand how frustrating that must be for these guys. Uh, they go on here to say that uh, unless Make Play Live could promise a quarter million. Or, or some other six-digit number of Make Play Live units, uh, they won't even be able to get into the process. They say, our order is a rounding error on the total units that device manufacturers are targeting. So definitely some changes. Uh, and he goes on to also, he reiterated, little respect for the GPL in some of the Asian markets. Massive road bumps the Vivaldi project has hit here. Uh, I don't know what... Uh, he hasn't said it's dead, uh, but it definitely sounds like it's it's struggling and uh, to uh, because of issues that are outside of their control. And he goes on to say, this is just a battle the community has to fight, and it's going to be a bad, long, nasty fight. But the community has to do it if we want to make it. So there you go. And uh, the chat room says maybe things like Firefox OS will help. Well, yeah, we'll see. We'll see about that. I have a story about that, actually. Let's talk about something good, though. Ubuntu 12.10 is in development, and one of the new features they were talking about recently kind of has my interest peaked, so I thought I'd share it with you. Check out this new feature. It's going to be integrated into Unity, so I know not all of you love Unity, uh, but how cool is this? If you're a Google Docs user or a big web apps user, they're blurring the lines of web apps. The feature allows web apps, sites, and services to integrate directly into the Ubuntu desktop to take advantage of Ubuntu technology, such as app menu, the HUD, the messaging menu, the sound menu, quick lists, and things like that. So here's a screenshot that uh, OMG Ubuntu has where they go up into the, the dash and they type insert, and it brings up options from Google Docs, like if Google Docs was a local application. Uh, and they also talk about having that same functionality in there for Last FM and, uh, you know, about 33 other sites at this point, uh, including Facebook and BBC News and uh, obviously Google Docs. Pretty interesting uh, level of integration and uh, sort of acknowledging that uh, these really sophisticated web-based apps are really one of the more enabling technologies for the Ubuntu desktop and uh, for Linux desktop in general. But, you know, if you can say we integrate with the Google Docs, well, more and more companies are actually switching to Google Docs. It's, it's crazy, but it's, it's happening. And if you can say we work with all of that and we're a free desktop and we don't have the Metro interface, when Windows 8 hits, these things are compelling features. I mean, 1210 will be shipping around the same time in October, I believe, I think that's the yeah right yeah 10 uh and that's when i, I think what windows 8 was announced for october 26th uh so it, the people will make the comparison there and this is a feature that they say we're embracing the open web we're embracing these these universal these universal web applications that work across all your platforms where microsoft's saying use metro use office 360 use the Metro store, these kinds of things. It's a very different message and one that I don't think is going to go over well with corporate desktops, whereas this might actually be getting that kind of functionality integrated just at the right time. And while, of course, uh, Ubuntu right now is the only distro that can rock Unity, Fedora doesn't want to be left out. Uh, thanks to actually some work at the, at the OpenSUSE project, and the packages for this are actually hosted in OpenSUSE repos, uh, Ubuntu's Unity desktop has been ported to Fedora 17. And... It, I just, I got a kick out of this. Uh, I I don't know why you'd do this. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, you you got to get over, you know, the right version of comp is and you got to get all that stuff. But here it is. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching the video version of the big show, uh, there, <laughs> right there, for the first time ever, I am witnessing Unity running on top of Fedora. And you know what? It kind of looks like Unity running on top of Ubuntu. Turns out. That's what it looks like. If you're listening to the audio version, picture, uh, picture Ubuntu only blue. and uh, And you've got it. All right, well, let's talk about a game that we've mentioned before on the show, but at the time wasn't free and available for everyone to download, but now it is. And remember, this is kind of a Diablo clone. It's the Heroes of West North, right? Am I getting that right? The Heroes of New Earth. New Earth. This is sort of the Diablo clone. Now, I'll be honest. I went the route of actual Diablo, and I got it working under Wine using Play on Linux. And Play on Linux has a script that's actually been developed by, by folks at Blizzard. So I, it's, it, you know, it's, it's pretty bulletproof. Um, and I just downloaded the executable from their website and then just used Play on Linux to install it. Uh, but 
If you wanted to go the free route and you didn't want to buy Diablo, this might be the way to go. Heroes for New Earth, and it's it's available now, and uh, it is a it it looks it reminds me a little more of Diablo two on genre. And uh, if you like a good uh, hack and slash, this is it. It's it's uh, not what oh, it's a D O T A game. It's a Dota, not Diablo. Oh oh, it's more like Dota. Oh, see, I haven't played it. The chat room is doing. I'm getting real time correction from the chat room right now. Oh, okay. Well, that's actually, that's probably, well, okay. See, I noticed it got kind of like a channel thing going here. Oh, that's really compelling. I have a friend who really, really loves that. Uh-huh. Well, thank you, chat room. See, that's why it's so good to do these shows live. If you want to join us live and correct me when I say something stupid, like a Diablo clone, because I haven't played it yet, but I know it's free and people care about it, so I mentioned it. But that was silly of me. That was silly. And you could join that tra- chat room and say, Chris, no, it's not Diablo. And we do that on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv or jblive.info if you want to get the audio streams. <laughs> really, chat room? I put you up for a little bit and you start misbehaving. All right, moving on. Uh, just uh, two quick PSAs before we get out of the news segment. We're just doing a quick one since, uh, since it's just me. But there were so many great headlines, I still wanted to keep you guys kind of current. Now... I did a PSA for you Arch users a couple of weeks ago about slash lib changing to a sim link, and a lot of you still got bit by it in the subreddit, so I'm calling you out. I'm giving you another heads up about Arch. This one, though, isn't quite the same thing, although I am slightly concerned. I'll say this goes on my concern list, and I'm tracking it now. Uh, Dieter Petalinic? Oh, jeez, man, that's brutal. Jeez, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, he, uh, one of the lead Arch devs in charge of releases, has resigned, and... This seems like a pretty big story, and the reaction on, on Reddit has, has not been positive about this. But here, uh, I'll read his first paragraph, because it actually sounds like he might be the guy. Uh, he says, Hi, I'm stepping down as the last remaining release engineer member. It's not so much a lack of time, it's more about a lack of mental energy and interest. Uh, so, very sad. He's obviously, I believe he's been a, you know, a long-time key Arch uh, development member. And uh, he, the way he writes that, he might be the sole release engineer. Uh, but uh, the Arch Linux distribution is a vulnerable distribution that I know there's there's plenty of good people. In fact, he goes on to talk about how there's already people that are potentially likely candidates to step up, and he gives out their names and gives them props. So this isn't like, you know, end of days kinds of things. But it's always sad when, a, when somebody who's been a critical member of a distro that we all love gets to that point where they burn out. And it's a good reminder to be nice to our maintainers because they are people too, and they get cranky sometimes. All right. Well, that's all the news for this week. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, So uh, this week, Matt and I are going to talk about one of my favorite backup utilities, which can be a little tricky to get installed under 64-bit Ubuntu and probably Debian, too, Mm -hmm. I would assume. Uh, And that's Jungle Disk. And there's even also some UI hacks Matt's going to walk us through. Absolutely. So I'm looking forward to this. What's going on? Yeah, well, basically, when you want to install Jungle Disk on 32-bit Ubuntu and probably other related distributions, you'll find that it installs reasonably easy. Install the dev package, bam, 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 Jungle Disk desktop, no big deal. However, for 64-bit Ubuntu, you're going going to end up with an error. And I'm going to show you what that error looks like and essentially what you're running into in this little bash script here. So I basically ran the command as you would in a terminal, jungle disk desktop. Normally that would in fact start jungle disk. Unfortunately, instead we are getting this error right here. And it's giving us a nag about the fact that it can't find libnotify. Libnotify, huh? Libnotify. So it's, so it's it, a library issue. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to close that and say, all right, well, I need to fix that. So there's actually a command you can run to create a symbolic link to correct the issue. And this little guy is going to run this command right here. Okay, so you, what you're actually doing is you're doing a symbolic link from one version of the libnotify right. library to uh, to the to another spot where the jungle disk program is looking for it. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly it. Exa- and it's it's literally the, almost the same. So animal. it's fine with the version. It just yep. doesn't know where to look for it. And you can see the command right here that I'm using. Basically, it's just creating that symbolic link for yep. me. And then yep. of course it's placing it where it needs to go. So and that's that all link. Good to go. And if you're listening to the audio version, or uh, that's a little hard to write down, Matt will have all that in the show Absolutely. notes. Absolutely. Yeah. You betcha. So in order for me to do this, because I'm doing it with sudo, I need to enter my password. Okay. Cool. And it's giving me little props there. All That's right. nice. Yeah. It's kinda kinda and I'll throw these you. bash scripts in here because, I mean, I'm terrible at bash, but I'll make sure to throw them out there for you. <laughs> so now that's awesome because now when we run jungle disk, it will, in fact, run. Hey, look at that. See? It starts up. Yep. Now, 
one thing that you might notice is that, hey, it's starting up here up here in the panel, and yeah. I don't know if you can see that. Right. That is because I did something to allow that to happen. Those of you that run Skype or various other programs uh, may have noticed that a lot of stuff doesn't appear up here in the panel on 64-bit yeah. Ubuntu. Yeah. Now, the easiest way to do it, if you're willing to work a terminal, is to simply, and again, I'll have this in the show notes, but you can run a single command that whitelists Pretty much everything, all, as it will. Holy crap, that looks like a Mac OS X command. It's yeah. a set com.canonical.unity.panel, yeah. panel, and then you're you're passing a variable to it. Exactly. And by running this command, which it just did when I executed this, it actually uh, made sure that everything oh, okay. will then appear up there at the top. And yeah. if you want to do this with a, a GUI, you can use the deconf editor, which is a little slower, but it works fine if you want kind of that newbie feel. Oh, okay. And so I can bounce from uh, desktop to Unity to panel. And I can then enter that myself. And so you're saying whitelist all applets, basically. Exactly. The default, um, if you should screw up, you can click the default button below. Oh, and it reverts? Yeah, it'll revert back to Java Embed Frame. Bob's your uncle. And, yeah, exactly. It reverts the whole thing back to, uh, in case you goof something up, so no big deal. So, And I'll show you how to do that both in the show notes for both the command line and for the uh, little deconf editor action. Fair so nice. that's awesome. And the bonus is that now, when I run Skype, by gosh, it will actually come up to the panel like it's supposed to. Very cool. Did you get it? I don't know if you, I don't yeah. think you got it. Maybe it didn't click. Fire torpedoes, Matt. Fire torpedoes. There, there, you, go. Go. Oh, there you go. A little clickage. It's that, uh, it's that nice it vintage mouse you have. Yeah. There. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. And as you can see, we have it up here in the panel for those that are watching us in video. Yeah. And uh, you're good to go. Normally, if I had not made that, uh, made that edit to all, Skype, like other apps, would not show up. Now, if you want to do it sp to specific things, you can make it to only work with uh, Skype. Or you can make it only work with uh, Jungle Disk. Uh, oh, so instead of yeah. doing like all in there, maybe you, you might. Bet. You can be app specific. And I'll show you how to do that as well because I've done that on another machine. I don't necessarily want everything. Is there a reason why you might want to do that? Does like, do they get crashy um, or something? No. For most people, it's if you have a powerful enough machine or you really are just open to having anything and everything up there work, that's fine. If you want to limit how, what's appearing in your panel, you can leave what you have by default, go into Deconf Editor, and actually enter things in manually, okay. by, like Skype and so on and so forth. Well, and you could also just go through that and just see what other options are available yeah. to tweak. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Be And be careful when you're playing in here. Make sure you got your default options that you okay. can click on to. But for the most part, you can get into deconf, and if you screw something up, you can hit default and go back to the old school version. Another nice thing to know that's going to save you a lot of frustration that most tutorials I've ever seen don't mention is that if you find that it's not working, it's because you need to log out and log back in. Oh, yeah. Uh, most, how Windows. Yeah, how very, how very Windows. You don't necessarily have to reboot, but you, <laughs> right. you got to log in. It's, Otherwise, it will not It's take. one step better, I guess. Exactly. Well, cool. So, of course, Matt's doing this on a Wild Dog Performance PC that was mm -hmm. uh, brought, brought to you by System76. I want to say thanks to System76. Matt, have you been over to System76's they, website? I'm really excited about their new homepage. It's yeah. really awesome. They got they some did. good videos over. I'm just saying, maybe like if you dig around in the desktop yeah. section, and maybe you go over to Leopard Extreme, and you look oh, around in here, there stuff. might be some videos in here that are pretty good. Yeah, you, oh, that video. Oh, oh hey, geez. who's that? Who's that? <laughs> so anyways. Yeah, uh, a little bit of us in there. Yeah, that's cool. So uh, thanks to System76 for sponsoring this segment. And thanks to Matt for showing me how to use Jungle Disk better. All right, yep, that's all there is to it. Jungle Disk, 64-bit Ubuntu. No more pulling your hair out because of some Simlink hair. Yeah. Back to you guys. Thanks, Matt and Chris. And that brings us to the end of this week's show. Now, before I get out of here, I'm going to cover a couple of emails. But before I get to those, I want to ask you for your handy Bash scripts. In next week's episode, I'm going to cover a Bash script that has become my favorite podcast download client. It all runs in the command line. It's crazy easy to use, and it's super elegant. I absolutely love it. That'll be my handy Bash script for next week. But I want to hear your suggestions. So email me, linuxactionshow at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Dot com, or go over to the top of Jupiter Broadcasting and hit that contact button and then select Linux Action Show and send me in your most useful bash script. I'd love to uh, I'd love to see something you might have made yourself too. But if uh, you have, put put it up like on uh, slexy.org or something like that or paste bin and uh, that way I can uh, that way I can go there and that might be better than emailing the actual bash script itself. Now slexy.org is what I'm using here to read this email. This is an email that was sent into the show from Scott. And Scott says, Darktable for Linux. Hey, guys, check out Darktable. It's a pretty much an open-source Lightroom for pro photo touch-ups and editing. It's available for Ubuntu, Debian, Fedora, and repos. It's already in there. So here's Darktable for the Linux. 
and the Linux operating of systems, and it looks pretty good. It I, I actually don't generally use anything this intense, um, but I know a lot of people out there are looking for Lightroom replacements or um, Lightroom, and then there is uh, Aperture. These are kind of the competitors for these. And so check out Darktable, darktable.org, if you've been looking for something like that. That would never have been on my radar, but I wanted to say thanks to Scott for, for sending that in so that way I knew to go check that out. Now, this one almost was my Runs Linux this week, but I didn't have a picture of it, so I decided not to. But I still wanted to cover it. This was sent in by Anonymous, and you'll find out why. Anonymous writes, uh, Hey, great work on your last episode. I'm a huge fan. Anyways, for, your, for uh, the Linux Action Show, I, I work in the Canadian Forces, and I know for a fact that computers in our offices used for simulation training run CentOS. Now, I don't know if I'll get crap for this, but I'll try to get a picture of the computers running it. Uh, but just keep my name out of it so that way they don't track it back to me. All right, you got it, Anonymous. So keep your name out. But how cool is that? The Canadian Forces get trained in simulators that run CentOS. I've actually spent a lot of time with CentOS uh, the last uh, few weeks. I picked up a client to pick up a little extra money and uh, ended up working in a CentOS environment. And it's been an interesting challenge because I'll be honest, I've spent the last few years uh, in server capacity pretty much in a Debian environment. Um, but... Uh, CentOS is a very good operating system. Anyways, I'm almost out of here. This has been a little bit of an unusual show since it was just me here for most of it. But before I go, I wanted to make a little announcement. We've got a lot of people saying we want to support the network. I love some of the shows you do. I get a lot of value out of your content. In fact, I hear some people, they almost watch our shows over TV in general. And that's, that's awesome. But some of you are not fans of PayPal. And so I am very happy to announce that if I get out of the boop, right there and you scroll down on the front page of jupiterbroadcasting.com look at that we now have amazon payments for a seven dollar a month monthly subscription if you would like to support the network if you go over to the donate page we also have a ten dollar a month amazon and also although probably not applicable to the majority of you watching the linux action show but if you go to the very bottom of the site not only do i have our standard awesome affiliates but we now also have a netflix affiliate for the u.s now Unfortunately, Netflix is jank in the sense that they don't support the Linux desktop, but that doesn't mean it doesn't run on many fine Linux running devices like the Roku and the Boxy, which is how I watch it, watch it or, uh, you know, Android devices that run Linux or uh, all of the devices that basically are set-top boxes that run Linux that Netflix runs fine on. Um, if you are thinking about getting a Netflix sign-up and you want to help out the network, you can use that link. Or if you know somebody who wants to get Netflix, maybe send them that link and you'll find that at the very bottom of jupiterbroadcasting.com all right now i want to hear your favorite bash script so email those in linux action show at jupiterbroadcasting.com and uh, be sure to check us live over at jblive.tv at 10 a.m pacific or the show is available for download in just about any format you could possibly want high definition mobile audio og whatever you want it's over at jupiterbroadcasting.com as well as links to all of the things we talked about in this week's episode of the linux action show all right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to this week. See you right back here next week. Chugging <laughs> <laughs> oh, for pineapple. If you don't ever watch, I have this little dance that I do to make sure that uh, my stream didn't drop after I hit the record button.